This is Pete Moore on Halo Talks NYC. I have the pleasure of having from Metabolic, which I've been hearing about for years, from Christopher Jacob, Brandon Cullen, Cully, Ontario, now in Charlotte, North Carolina. We're going to talk about building a business and building a franchise and doing what you love. So, Brandon, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Been a fan for years. Awesome. So, you know, give us a little background on, uh, you know, your hockey career and uh, how that kind of led you into what you've done and how it's unique in the fitness industry based on, you know, training like a professional athlete for so many years. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Hockey is an interesting talking point. I don't mind admitting. I think I was an average player. You know, I realized I got to the minor leagues um, and played in some great organizations with the Rangers and the Islanders. But truth is fitness, the, the, the fitness angle was fitness was my equalizer, my partner and I's equalizer. We were average gifted players that everything we could control behind the scenes allowed us to be a little bit more relevant on the ice with these, you know, some very, very talented people at these, uh, these next levels. So we took it serious, um, kind of became, I was introduced to it through a personal trainer when I was around 16, 17. And then, yeah, kind of became an obsession. How could I have a little bit of an edge over uh, my players? So I don't want to say transitioning into fitness was an easy business decision, but at least it made sense to give it a go. Uh, if that makes sense. Gotcha. You know, we, uh, we partnered up years ago with uh, Tony Greco uh, out of Ottawa. So we saw some of the workouts that he was creating and the interest in the general population, you know, training like a you know professional hockey player, um, you know, as you kind of have tested that out uh, with metabolic, what was the first location and how much did that cost? And what we talk about a lot is, you know, figuring out what the special sauce is yeah. of, of your brand and of your, your offering. So maybe talk us through how long that took, um, you know, some of the things that you had as like an aha moment. Sure. Yeah, there's definitely an aha moment. So we were in the strength and conditioning world straight out of our professional careers as hockey players. Um but we were in the sport of fitness. So CrossFit long before it became cool in hip hop culture. Um, and you gotta, if you guys remember like this time when you're thinking, uh, 2005 through that through 2010, it was a very different scene, right? Um, it wasn't as inclusive as you would imagine. It was a lot of professional athletes, uh, college athletes, ex military. So like all of that stimulus made all the sense in the world and then a hip hop culture, and I don't want to say we were the only people that started questioning what you should do with this model on a general population. Um, but yeah, we were one of the people thinking this way. And in short terms, we started experimenting with team-based conditioning workouts on the weekends. And we just started noticing that different people were coming in the doors. We removed the scoreboard. We removed the barbell. We started play, playing around with a lot more work to rest ratios versus chasing um, reps, I guess is an easy way to say it, or trying to win a workout. And that aha moment became when we actually uh, funded a second location and put this experimentation into a full program. And within six months, we knew we made a big dent um, in the industry. So we've been trying to essentially for the last 10 years, build a product for everyday athletes that are actually looking to continually age athletically with a very strength bias approach, which it, it, I'm, I'm not, not stepping, stepping out of line saying, saying in the group fitness, fitness model, it, it is a very different approach than what is popular out there. Or, or you know what, what, what is common. So I mean, we're popular, but I, the, the, the broad audience, what is common with the people we compete with. Got it. Yeah, you know, I looked at some of your videos uh, over the last couple of days. You want to first explain, you know, the MAD uh, acronym, which uh, you know, I know you got uh, a, a podcast, which is uh, uh, guilty, what, playing guilty, playing guilty, guilty. Yeah. Um, you know, tell, tell us what MAD represents, and you know, it's not just MAD crazy fitness, but uh, give us the uh, acronym. Yeah, you know, it's funny. So you talked about this being very much a business uh, podcast. Well, a lot of times when you are building 
a company to reach the general population, you actually have to use um, basic terminology. You have to talk to them like everyday people. So we were doing some pretty scientific driven work to rest ratios, um, but we needed a human factor to have that uh, everyday person relate to it. So the MAD acronym, it's kind of funny to look back at it now. We literally were looking at the style of intervals we were offering and trying to find words that would represent what we were doing. So if you think of like momentum, it now stands for a gradual build in intensity anaerobic pretty self-explanatory we're going after an intense anaerobic effort and then the d the durability is this slower grinding pace focusing more on kind of strength stability and just like a sustained grueling effort so i mean it's it's cool to, to sit back and say this now but we were literally just in google thesaurus searches trying to find words that fit the ma the mad acronym right and the thing that i think is really cool about that now is we could probably sell shirts in our lobby with just a giant MA or D on it. And people would buy uh, the shirt that they identified with as their favorite interval. And to kind of look back at that is a cool thing to see, you know, they're living, breathing things that um, our clients relate to these days. That's great. So when you first, uh, so, so the second location was kind of like, okay, we, we figured out what the program is going to be, what the layout's going to be. When did you make the determination, hey, we're going to go and franchise this versus we're going to you know, do a corporate rollout? Yeah, so we, um, we started making some noise in Charlotte pretty quick, like six months in. And the first business opportunity we had, we had local Charlotte clubs asking if we would implement our program into more of their big box model. And being young entrepreneurs, me and my partner are like, well, this doesn't make sense, putting people directly in competition with ourselves. And then if I'm being honest, the corporate structure had a ceiling for the type of capital we had at that point. So um, we were introduced to franchising. We, we hired a consulting firm out of, uh, I think it was San Diego, and they kind of walked us through that first, first FDD. We built it out. And we started franchising the model because, you know, I think the one thing my partner and I have always been good with is understanding our bandwidth and our skill set. And for us at that point, franchising, I think, was the, the only way to go at a certain level of growth versus the corporate model. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like um, a lot of groups that we work with, they put the franchise agreement together, um, but they haven't really nailed the prototype yet. So the, the first set of franchisees are almost like an experiment or an extended <laughs> experiment. Sure. So when you started your first couple of franchise locations, you kind of like, you got to change your mindset to like, who's my customer right now? Who's my member? My member is, you know, the, the population coming into my studio. Now you're, you, your client is really, you know, a business owner that is using your operating model. So did you kind of change your mindset or say, wow, now I've got to basically, and, and we've done this and I use this term almost every podcast, you know, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. Mm -hmm. And we franchised too quickly with one of the companies we had. And then these franchise owners would come back and say, Hey, how does this thing work? How do I make money? You know? So how did you kind of think about, you know, what your role and responsibilities were and, you know, now you've got a level of stress that you don't have, didn't have before, you, you know, basically you and your partner, we're going to make this work and we're going to be here as long as we need to, but now you're extending it. Now you're responsible for their p &L. Yeah, it's interesting. So I think I would have answered this differently during that time. And now I can actually sit. So now we are, you know, now we're a well-oiled machine and uh, we have the right kind of partners that are backing us. We have the right kind of financial partners, the right kind of scaling partners. And I actually can sit here humbly. And like you said, I can look back and, and funny enough, and, I, and I'll humbly admit to it. I know now what I didn't provide at a certain level of scale. With that being said, we were so cautious um, on growing where we really only took slam dunk people and slam dunk markets. We didn't chance too, too much at that. Because to be honest, 
my partner and I did the first 10 units all by ourselves with no help. Um, we literally did everything and there was enough time to handhold through the process. You know, if you think of those 10 units only over six, seven years, working through one or two a year, not undoable. You know what I mean? Um, and we were fine doing that. Uh, we thought if we continually did, if we really focused on the quality and the type of workout and, and kind of that uh, passion for excellence, we did think one day we'd sit in a room with some smart individuals. And, you know, you fast forward uh, seven, eight years, our partners, uh, Z Growth Partners, they brought that franchisee, franchisor experience, the operational uh, systems behind it, the capital behind it, and it allowed us to reprioritize and refocus on the product. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. We were never in a place in those early years to be like, oh man, what did we do? Um, in fact, we were aware enough to stop franchise sales at one point for about 18 months to make sure we went back and address certain parts of the system to make sure when it was time to go again, we could go. I mean, that's, that's, that's music to my ears. Um, you know, you'll see in the book that we, uh, we say, you use your timeouts, you know, yeah. in sports, you always use your timeouts because something bad's about to happen or something bad just happened and use them and fix it and then continue on. Um, one of the things that a franchisor has to do probably 95% of the time is say no. You said like you were very discerning on who you brought on. Um, you seem like a guy who likes to say yes more than no, like, hey, I could fix this or hey, I, can, I can make you stronger. Um, so how did you get comfortable with saying no? Uh, and obviously people want to take your brand. So that's, you know, endearing and, you know, feels nice. But you say, hey, look, this, this just isn't going to work. And now you've got people out there saying, hey, these guys turn me down. You know, you got people talking. Yeah, it was a... Uh... I had to learn this early and I've used this analogy on a lot of different interviews or podcasts, but um, I've always been able to kind of have people, teammates rally around something I was passionate about. So I, I would, I would coin that term as I was, I was a natural leader by way of example, but I found out quick that I was a pretty average manager of people. Um, and it's something I'm still working on. And, you know, now I have some just tremendous teammates that that deal with that franchisee franchisor role a lot better than I ever was wired to do. And it's kind of beautiful to watch that. Um, yeah, it's weird because like if you think of franchises and franchisees, even though you're part of a system, a lot of what. Uh, the disagreements you have and saying yes or no, it becomes very hyper local, whether you're within a system or not, the franchisee, it is, it is their business. And yes, they have to operate within um, our system. When it comes to hiring, there's only so much you can say. You can provide strong suggestions. You can lock down things like membership menus and the way you systematize the workouts, but like running the business for them, we all know that's not franchising. Um, being a franchisor is trying to support them. And uh, a lot of times you do have to say no. And you know what the weirdest thing is and the toughest thing um, that uh, I don't think franchisors talk about enough is Usually you have to say no to your strongest franchisees right. to set an example for some of your average performing franchisees, because you can't just give the superstars all the rope to do whatever they want, because it sets a bad example within your system. So I do often, you know, at times you, you sometimes want to reward or give someone a little bit more slack that's killing it. But in order to run a successful system, I think you have to be pretty even and universal with all those relationships. Great. So some of the groups that have grown at amazing and exponential rates, if you look at Orange Theory, uh, Massage Envy, uh, those two in particular, they set up a model where they sold area development agreements mm -hmm. on a personal basis or you know, maybe half the state to a group. Um, and then those people were then able to sub-franchise it and they would take a percentage of the royalties. So 
as much as corporate, you know, has to approve every franchisee in the network, you know, you lose touch with that, that connectivity. Um, but you also get a lot more dollars up front and you've got more salespeople, you know, in the system. So, you know, as you've built out metabolic and I see all the states that you have listed on, on the website right now, how do you go through that system? Have you been able to identify, you know, certain traits as their professional athletes? We, we invested a company called the athlete book and that's bringing D one, D two, three athletes, you know, into yeah. systems. So w- what are some of the criteria without kind of giving us the, uh, you know, the checklist of, you know, here's what you need to say. Yes. Uh, get a yes out of, uh, out of Cully. Yeah. Well, um, most businesses, to be honest, uh, fail because they're un- undercapitalized is one of the biggest things. Um, we really do believe that we can teach our system to the right kind of people. But if you have an absentee investor, you have to really staff up in the general manager, lead trainer kind of role. And I think as long as you're very much upfront about that early on, it doesn't surprise that ownership structure later when they may think they were going to be the GM or face when that wouldn't have suited that business. I can't speak to the orange theories or F45s with this massive growth um, in in relation to that uh, area development deal. And and the reason I say this is we will be open to that, especially internationally, but our primary goal as our unit today is to get to 200 successful units in the next five years. It's quite a bit different, right, than the 900 or 1200 at the F45 and Orange Theories are kind of shooting towards. Let's be honest. And I don't mean this in a a rude way. They are going after a broad audience. They may not say that, and, and I'm fine with that, but like their reach and the way that they chase a, a more um, inclusive, broad audience where everybody's welcome allows, I think, them to chase 1,200 units. I think our goal of identifying, let's say, the top 50 markets in the United States, North America, maybe even, and then based on population density, psychographics, and all that stuff, dropping two to five units in those markets, I think it gets you to those 500, or sorry, it gets you to the 200 fairly conservatively. And then it allows us not to hang out in the broad argument, because if you go, if you're going broad, there's a lot of voices you have to listen to. There's, 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 there's a lot of different things you have to consider when we hit a market we are looking for 300 type A go-getters, not a body type, but someone just that has a mindset that I'm looking for a little bit more. I really like structure. I value professionalism. And, and I'm here to, and I'm here to say, guess what? That's a smaller market than this broad market, but that broad market is competitive. It is crowded. And I, I feel better in our space chasing that go-getter, you know, whether it's a franchisee or a client. Gotcha. When you take a look at marketing that message to get those people, you know, you've got a lot of noise, as, as you say, you've got CrossFit that's kind of going after, you know, that part of the spectrum, probably, you know, exhibit A here on the, on the far left, then you probably have your metabolic, then you've got F45, Orange Theory, and then a lot of other, you know, hit related workouts. So you, your videos are great. They're short. They're to the point. Uh, it's easy to understand. One of your FAQ questions was, can I bring my, my pets to the, to the class, which I thought was, you know, frequently asked questions. I don't know, maybe there's a pet fitness component to this. Um, but how many workouts do you need to do a month in order to get the results? Uh, and then how do you get this message across that? Like, here's where we fit and this is who you are. Yeah, it's wild. Like education is the educating the um, un, uneducated consumer is a, is a difficult uh, conversation. And when I say that uh, uneducated, I mean they're not all uh, leaving school with an exercise science degree, right? right? They're 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 Joe that's on the trading floor at Bank of America here in Charlotte, and a, and a busy parent or a you know. So 
that message is it takes some time to sell. It takes some time to teach because what we are being told in this broad um, space is more and more and more hotter yoga rooms, two a days, calories, fat loss. And we're saying come four days a week, prioritize rest, train at different speeds and intensities every day and focus on a 12 week uh, approach and focus on a calendar year versus getting fit in 30 days. So it, it, you know, it's funny, we sit on a, on a show like this with some uh, fitness professionals or business professionals. And isn't it crazy that what I just said there is, is an outlier message, like slow down, you know, change up your routine or not your routine, change up your intensity, <laughs> take some rest, maybe eat a salad and, um, you know, yeah, it's just I, weird. Yeah, I was going to bring in Chris, uh, who's uh, who's an avid yeah, uh, part of the cult. About to, Go ahead, Chris. I was about to, to jump in. I, I don't uh, I don't know who in the, the the reasonable workout community could do four a week or, or certainly more for the week. But I know you guys have seen to the point of on your social and stuff. Um, you know, advocate uh, like I don't, I don't think you would let people show up. You know, more than four times a week because you know that's not. Uh, not a, uh, a sustainable, uh, <laughs> physical thing with a, with a weight loaded workout. And, um, you know, as intense as some of them can be, it's, it's just a different, a different thing. I've seen new members, uh, in my local studio attempt it, uh, and think they're going to come and it's going to be different. And it's just, uh, you know, after I think, I think most people figure it out on their own after a few days, but I know you guys, you know, outwardly advocate that, which from the business side is obviously certainly unique given that you do sell memberships that have class counts and stuff. So um, you're probably leaving some money on the table with the concept that you can't come, um, you know, 30 days. Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, yeah, I love this fact, maybe more so than any fact uh, that we have supporting our brand. But if you look at, uh, we've thrown around some big names and I'm not here to like name drop, but if you're just to take the boutique fitness industry as kind of like a blanket statement, um, their big sellers are like one and two day a week. So, you know, four or eight sessions a month. And these clients seem to be bouncing around all over the place. Um, over 70 I think close to 75% of our membership is on an unlimited monthly contract and they come four days a week. Now, four seems to be the sweet spot. Scientifically, um, you can see a big uh, return on investment going from three to four days a week. There's not much. And in fact, there's some factors that are negative when you go from four to five. And guess what? When you're dealing with everyday people, these aren't professional athletes that get to go sleep 10 hours a night, eat perfect food and take, you know, cold tubs, um, every day. Like you have to think of the stressors of life. And when you apply that on top of the stress of workout, and now you apply that to a six day a week calendar, um, there's just, there's, there's so much going on there. Uh, where our biggest thing is we really have two types of clients, right? You have Someone that outside of our doors, uh, they are passionate about something. Call it, uh, I'm a runner, I'm a yogi, um, a busy parent, and I, I, I think I need strength in my life. And, and we provide them that a couple days a week that makes them better at that thing outside of our doors. You know, and that's a small portion of our membership, maybe 25%. And then the other 75% are, this is what I want to do. I trust in what you're doing. I value professionalism and results. And we get them on that four day a week kind of commitment. And we're, we're not like so dogmatic about it. It's like, if you have a wedding, if you have a vacation, enjoy your vacation. But if you can commit to a weekly schedule, 80 to 90% of the year, you're going to see some pretty dramatic results with what we do. Yeah. When I got into this industry back in 1999, it was all about body transformation challenges. Mm. wasn't based on price. Uh, it was before and after pictures. And I feel like a lot of groups kind of forgot what they were trying to achieve on behalf of the membership base. So as a quick story, uh, one of our close friends, uh, Brian Mitchell, he was one of the top sales guys in uh, the powerhouse gym in, uh, in Venice Beach. And when somebody came in, 
uh, he'd say, how much weight do you want to lose? Like 25 pounds. So I could so go walk over to the, uh, to the uh, dumbbell rack, pick up a 25 pound weight, give it to the guy and then walk around the gym until that guy said, Hey, Brian, can I put this 25 pound dumbbell down? He's like, you know how good you're going to feel when you lose 25 Damn, there's a membership contract. Um, I love that story because that's what that guy was specifically wanted to achieve. And he's going to provide the results for that. Uh, somehow the message got lost with amenities and price and, you know, other things. So uh, I'm with you on the, on the results side, that should never change or, or not be part of the narrative. Yeah. And I, and I think um, it's interesting because making weight loss is not super complicated. I'm saying weight loss. Um, it's not hard to make somebody be tired. So we could have somebody a thousand calories a day and then have them do a hundred burpees and they're going to be tired and yeah, pounds are going to come off. But if you want a sustainable approach to actually like, <laughs> like we say, age athletically and live vibrantly, mm -hmm. that ain't the recipe. And as much as I love our industry, I also hate it for what is common and what is broad and what is sold to some of these people. So I, you know, I'm not, I'll be honest, we're not chasing a broad audience, but hopefully our approach could create some ripple effects that, you know, hits uh, or get people thinking a little bit differently. Maybe that's the way to say it. You know, look, we're, uh, our mission here is to try to, uh, solve or eradicate uh, diabetes, obesity, and loneliness. And that's going to be done at the local level, hyper local level, like you talk about. Um, so groups like you need to make sure they find the right franchisees, have the right amount of capital. Um, so that's the mission. We shouldn't need a, a cure for diabetes. The, we know what the cure is, you know, don't eat this and work out like that and we'll get rid of it. Uh, yeah. We had a crazy stat yesterday that 50% of the population by 2030 it's going to have diabetes on the trajectory that we're on. That's just completely yeah. unacceptable. Chris? Yeah, uh, two, two things related to this, Brandon, if, if I can add kind of on your behalf. One is is noting that regardless of times a week, you, you guys have crafted a program that's highly variable in in intensity. It's, you know, there, there's multiple kind of lanes that people go to a workout, they'll understand with different kind of weight loads and, and doing the same workouts. But, you know, it's a lot easier to, to vary. And I'm always intrigued by the people I see at my own local studio, which vary from, uh, uh, let's say, men I could never look like, <laughs> despite all my efforts, all the way down in the same exact class to uh, what I could best describe as very pregnant women that you know, are about to give birth, um, doing the same movements, just with different weights and, and modifications. And, and, you know, so it's a, it, it is broad in that sense, but it's no, you know, the workouts are not all about, um, and especially with kind of the MAD, you know, different day philosophy, it's not about, you know, you guys very specifically have days that are not about 100% you know, effort and, and walking as fast or running as fast every single time. So you can still show up, um, you know, what it means to come four days a week can vary according to, to how you're feeling as, you know, as long as you show up, you're going to get a good workout, but you're not going to burn yourself out. I, well, I yeah, that's and that's, that's the beauty of well-structured interval training. And when I say interval training, I mean, like Chris said, interval training, hit, is a type of interval training. It's not interval training, it's a type. And like you said, Chris, if we were doing, I'll give you three examples of, you know, a uh, using the MAD we started with. So if we're having a gradual build in intensity and our workout is 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off, and we're gonna do that for six cycles through five movements, and we're gonna bump our intensity, whether that's your intensity or the weight you're lifting, every couple cycles, that's different for every single person on this call, their level of intensity, the weight they're going to lift. If we go to anaerobic, you're in a one-to-one -one work to rest ratio. Let's say we're doing one minute on one minute off. Well, again, everyone on this call, that minute is different. But if I'm saying, give me your best minute, I think time's relatable to people. And finally, the durability, like, let's say, okay, we're going to do some walking lunges and some heavy carries and some slide boards for two to five minutes. Rest when necessary, but get as much out of those two to five minutes as you can. 
it's a very different approach to guiding people through a safe workout versus chasing a, a set number of reps that maybe certain people shouldn't do or lifting a weight that is not appropriate for them. So again, I, it, when I say this stuff out loud, I giggle that we are the weird voice saying these things, but I, but I do also, you know, COVID in a weird way was a little bit of an accelerant to us living better. And you could apply that to the, the, the way people look at work from home, just recovery in general, mental health. And I think in our bias defense, a strength bias approach with recovery, it's just this perfect storm of us trying to live a little bit smarter, I think. That's great. Um, I love how you're thinking about the business methodically and that the growth is not a number that somehow uh, makes you change your lens on what you're trying to achieve on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So I think people out there should really think about, you know, what's your goal and not what's your number of units, you know, at the end of the day. So, um, Cole, at the I think uh, if I can uh, yeah. Hey Pete, real fast, just because I wanted to, to make sure I got something out on, on this from my perspective. Uh, Brandon is exactly what you just said, Pete. Uh, I, I think the unique thing about your concept, Brandon, is that the workouts are literally planned an entire year in advance down to you guys have the, the schedule printed on the wall and in the app. So it's, you know, you, you guys are committed. And I, I think one of the highest compliments I can pay to you that, that kind of combines the world that we talked about on the podcast is that, you know, in 2021, when we were, you know, got vaccines, you know, us included at Integrity Square kind of assume this view that, you know, quote unquote COVID was over and and, and go back full force. You guys have a uh, kind of your biggest group event called Game Day, which is a quarterly check-in on performance that you excluded in 2021, which um, is probably the most pressing thing I've seen that even throughout 2021, even though that's a core part of your, your program to monitor practice, you, you did not allow in the schedule for these you know, large group events, knowing that, you know, who knows? So certainly people could could come to classes on their own, but kind of getting the entire membership base together, even throughout 2021, may still not be a good idea. And so while everybody else was, you know, re-ramping, I think you guys you demonstrated the, the importance of planning ahead for, for even the most obscure things. And, you know, it's back in 2022, and that's great, but you kind of uh, yeah. modified it, went along. Also, too, uh, we, I, and I'll just figure, uh, I think we did an amazing job with COVID. Um, so when everybody was, <clears throat> I always thought this is a mistake, but when everybody was trying to, to learn how to do digital uh, against these powerhouse media companies, we kind of went inward and just really worked on our systems. Uh, we were always firm believers that uh, the in-person experience was coming back. And even like as the vaccines came out and we were able to open our doors, we saw that. Um, it's always going to be around. Yes, digital is going to be a thing. I'm not arguing any of that. Uh, but what I'm saying is where a lot of people tried to become companies they weren't, we actually went back at our strengths and got better at everything internally. So the fact we were able to add so many units in 2021 when you kind of shouldn't have been, um, they'll all be opening in the next couple of years. And where we sit today operationally with our systems we feel real good about this momentum. And I think we used COVID um, very intelligently uh, to beef up and to staff up and to prioritize what was important for us. Awesome. So uh, in order to keep the, uh, the, the length of the podcast to a Little League six-year-old baseball <laughs> game, it was great having you on. Love how you're thinking about the business. Methodical, keep your head down, build value build value when you want to sell or you want to take in capital someone is going to pay for the value that you've created uh so i think there's a lesson here there's probably a case study that we'll do someday on halo academy and uh, look forward to meeting you in person absolutely guys again thank you um keep it up because it's, it's the one it, i check in weekly with what, who, whoever you guys are interviewing so i i finally got invited and uh just want to say thank you yeah we're talking to your agent for like three years we finally got you on all right but good work talk to you soon Thanks, guys. Later. Thanks.